Thank you very, very much for coming tonight. It's a, a special treat to have Robert E. Sonia uh, make a trip up to uh, LA from Chicago. I'm sure since we've got uh, a lot of friends, uh, Bob's here, most of you know Bob, for those of you who know, um, since 2007, <clears throat> he's been the director of the School of Architecture. Uh, at uh, the University of Illinois Chicago, and uh, so uh, now eight years into that uh, regime, I suppose. Uh, we'll talk about Chicago politics in a moment. And uh, I should openly thank you, Bob, for sending all your best students here. It's, it's uh, quite a pipeline. I think we've sent a few faculty to you, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so the ones I get, I have to pay the ones you get to pay you. <laughs> It's the way it works. Uh, um, <clears throat> Bob, uh, Bob has an undergraduate degree from uh, Brown University. Uh, he has a law degree from uh, Harvard University and a PhD on the history of culture from the University of Chicago. And as I like to joke with Bob, he's got more degrees than a protractor. <laughs> <laughs> He's got more degrees than the Sahara Desert. Uh, just some Bob Hope type jokes for Bob. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, warm everyone up. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe a lot of you know that, that Bob was a professor here for 10 years, uh, I think roughly during Sylvia's uh, time as chair from the mid-90s till uh, 2005 when he went to Ohio State and then, uh, and then went to, to Chicago. So needless to say, he's a, he's a friend of many of us uh, here and a friend of the school. And you know, with friends, there are enemies. And with enemies, there are arguments. And with arguments, there are manifestos. And with manifestos, there are wars. And I have to say that, that Bob has been one of the most uh, interested participants in all of those uh, scenarios and somebody whose, whose ambition has been very much to advance the conversation on architecture and I think whose, whose, uh, whose work in many ways uh, ranges from very blunt, black and white, uh, oppositional, classic forms of uh, uh, argumentation to, I think, uh, texts that use words like feathers and, and lots of uh, grayness and actually shade arguments and, and um, make arguments in different ways. And when I was thinking about the, the idea of a friend, I was thinking about uh, arguments and, and positions of wars and so forth. And I couldn't help but think of our culture uh, in architecture, which is, you know, if you think about how those lines are drawn and divided, and you think about, at least I thought about the term mafia. And, um, you know, to know Bob is to go back to him being a, a kid in New Jersey, um, half Italian, I should say, like me. Uh, uh, your mom's uh, maiden name was DiNapoli, Denari, DiNapoli. I think between us we, we make one whole Italian. But I say this just because in, in some ways Bob's early uh, life had him in, you know, one foot in the mob. The Sopranos factor, I think, is, has always been there. And he's been a part of a kind of architectural cosa nostra, uh, a world where people do their thing and other people do their thing and they kind of argue about things and, and uh, make uh, uh, things happen in our culture. And, and, and Bob has been just such an active participant uh, in that world. I looked further into the word mob, and, and actually it, it, it comes from the, from the Latin term mobile vulgus. It sounds really bad. <laughs> mobile vulgus translates as the fickle crowd. And of course, mob came from, from mobile. So at one level, the mob, which is a group of people who um, challenge you know, authority on the one hand, uh, is, is part of, I think, Bob's life. He's been a mobster and a very, very powerful one. You don't want to get on the other side of Bob. You want him to be your friend. 
uh, so that there's no critical horses' heads left in your bed, I should say, <laughs> at night, and you wake up and scream. I think many people have read his text and felt that because they're so uh, powerful and so challenging. And, and it's, it's hard for me not to continue the... Uh, the Godfather uh, scenario and the mob and the Rat Pack and so forth because when Bob moved out here, it's interesting. Uh, Sylvia, Greg, myself, we were all living in New York and Roger and, and there's a, there's you know, a very strong line obviously between the East Coast and the West Coast and the ways in which we play out uh, ideas of turf and identity and I think Bob took the, uh, let's say, the mass culture of California and, and multiplied it uh, drastically, I would say, times the uh, discriminating, fickle crowd mafia mentality. And I think he, he forged a persona uh, that is really inimitable in, in architecture. Now he finds himself in Chicago um, for the last uh, eight, nine years. Um, dealing with the, the machinery of Chicago politics, and we know all of those uh, stories, and I think uh, it's a perfect place for Bob to go back to. Uh, but we'll always know that you're a friend of the school and we want to stay on your good side. So please welcome Bob Solomon. Thank you. six months late on a text that I opened. Um, although I have, a, I have a suspicion he's, he's actually moved on to someone else, so that horse head may be coming. Um, <laughs> um, I have to say, when I, was about, when I heard that you were doing this building, I have to say, I was incredibly flattered to know that I would be interviewed for the job. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I can't tell you how I appreciate it, really. I mean, Scott and Liz and me, I mean, it's going to be a heck of a competition. Um, so it's really nice that I get to show you my work. And, uh, what? No? Okay, all right. Um, I can do something else. Um, so uh, I was asked for a topic about eight months ago from Caroline. <clears throat> And I never replied to her. <laughs> uh, and so last week she gave me an assignment. Uh, she said, 45-minute uh, lecturing focusing on your experience at UIC re-envisioning architecture. Um, it was the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, I can't talk about it anymore. Uh, but I realize I have no new work either. So uh, this is going to be somewhere between uh, uh, what, I, what I want to do in the next year and what I have been doing for the last eight years. Um, <coughs> so it's somewhere between a eulogy and a promise. Uh, stuff I'm tired about talking about and then other stuff that I uh, haven't done yet. Uh, so I would say expect a meal and not a menu. Um, uh, I also want to say that I'm very happy and also very stressed to be here because when you screw up in Nebraska, nobody knows. Um, you know, you don't really know anybody there. Uh, this is a, a crowd that uh, are longtime friends who I have great respect and admiration for. So it's a little bit different. It's one of those awkward homecomings where, you know, you don't, when I'm sure to show you make good of yourself. Um, my eight years here were incredibly uh, inspiring and, and uh, important for, you know, and what ended up happening in, in, uh, in Chicago. Um, it was a, a 97 2005 was time obviously when Sylvia was chair uh, and I want to express especially uh, how thankful I am that she demonstrated a typical lack of good sense and hired me um, uh, and really what we've done at USC <coughs> is in part uh, indebted to close up watching what she was able to accomplish here as well as uh, the incredible colleagues and friends uh, I worked with over the time here so I like to think of UIC as kind of like a baby sibling to UCLA uh, and you know, but in other ways, UIC is absolutely identical to UCLA. If you subtract money, technology, superstars, glamour, and good weather, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, identical. So, and I think as, as Neil mentioned, uh, you know, there is a kind of uh, train between the two places, so we've hired eight of your alumni in the last few years, four of them are still there. Uh, we've had ten of your faculty lecture over the last seven years. We send you our best undergraduates. We don't even mind when you steal our faculty. Um, <laughs> you know, so, I, I think we're really generous. And uh, I'm glad someone noticed, because I've been waiting for the phone call to come. So. <laughs> Um, so, uh, this will cover that. Um, I understand uh, that you guys had a birthday recently and just turned 50. So, happy birthday, AUD. Uh, uh, I don't know what you get the school that has everything, so I got you a pile of words. Um, I'd like to try to connect some personal work uh, with a kind of institutional story. Uh, I will fill 45 minutes and whenever we are, we stop because I can't wait to get together with Neil when we do our Clint Eastwood routine around the empty chairs. <laughs> um, so, uh, Robert Smithson, in a way, is here to sort of mark an anniversary that I'm attached to. It's almost a half century back, 1966. Uh, so, at the beginning of this talk, you're going to see a lot of 1966 things, starting with uh, the heap of language. Uh, and what I really want to talk about is the relation between image and text, or in architecture, or things and words, or maybe matter and size, uh, as a way to begin. So this is a pyramid of words, not of stones, uh, ambivalent about whether it's a text to be read or a drawing to be looked at. Um, so it's part of uh, this and that uh, in relation to uh, this will cover that, which is uh, obviously, uh, a reference to Hugo's uh, This Will Kill That, although it's maybe a nicer way to say it. Um, but it's also, you could say, the relationship of paper to stone, as in paper covers stone. Um, so, a year after um, a heap of language, Smithson co curated an exhibit at the Duan Gallery uh, and established, uh, uh, really established on that crossover between things and words with language to be looked at and things to be read. I will warn you that tonight you are in for a lot of uh, language to be looked at, uh, not too many things to be read. So it will give you, uh, unfortunately, my bias. So it's going to be a lot of reading up there, less stuff to read. We're just look at the words. Um, but I want to talk about, use this in a way to talk about the rise and fall of, of the paper age in architecture, uh, with its privileged subject of the architect critic but it's also a way to make a distinction between two ways to approach that collapse of architecture and criticism. Uh, one from the angle of the index, or what here would, I would call this things to be read, uh, versus the idea of a speech act, or what I would call language to be looked at. Um, and I would say that the rise and fall uh, uh, of paper architecture to now, in the paper age, to what we call our paperless age, uh, I will warn you it's a bit of a lament. Uh, I try not to that do that. I hate to be a Debbie Downer. Um, so I will try to avoid the lament, but um, you know, put a happy face on at the end sometimes. Um, uh, so this was uh, Michael Fried's response in 1967 to Smithson and his uh, co-curated show and uh, to his and his friend's work. Um, this is Fried's first line, famous that you all know, from his prosecution uh, of minimalism. Um, the enterprise known variously as minimal art, ABC art, primary structures and specific objects is largely ideological. This is the beginning sentence, right off the bat. It seeks to declare and occupy a position, one that can be formulated in words, and in fact has been formulated by some of its leading practitioners. Um, so one of the things that it notes, you could say, is the collapse of the distinction between artist and critic. In other words, uh, it's a problem with words, or in particular, artists using words. Um, and what's really beautiful about Freed's denigrated category of literalism uh, is that it does both jobs in a sense that the minimalist artist critics do, which is uh, collapses things in words. So literalist in the sense of you know physical literal objects, but also literal in the sense of words. Uh, and it's that collapse between, in this case, art and criticism, uh, and for our uh, say analogous hybrid professional role uh, of the architect critic in architecture. Uh, that really sets in motion at that point uh, a new kind of auteur and a new kind of uh, agency, you could say, in art or, in our case, in 
Um, so the first 1966 <coughs> present is, of course, Words and Things uh, by Foucault, which is one of those uh, uh, background moments of thinking about this collapse of <coughs> science and matter. Uh, as I said, uh, the title <coughs> goes back to uh, Victor Hugo's line about uh, essentially the way that culture had used to be inscribed in stone, uh, but that with the invention of movable type and the Gutenberg press, uh, that really the cultural history is now written in paper, no longer in stone, uh, and that's the sense in which the book fills the building. Um, the, I say cover, really, because I mean in a lot of senses, you know, cover to protect or to hide or to um, lie for or to report on. Um, I think uh, covering has more... Uh, you could be burying it, or you could be uh, supporting it or protecting it. Um, you could say that in a way this uh, early polemical Quadrante magazine photograph of Tarani's uh, Casa del Fascio soon after it opened uh, also tells that story in, in uh, fascist Italy uh, in the sense that this, the Olivetti typewriter, uh, will kill that, uh, the church, or uh, the political uh, source of power in fascist Italy against the search or the church or the word uh, against the cathedral. Um, the, <clears throat> a different political economy where you can get the same thing really is the 1969 typewriter drawing uh, by Arfizum for No Stop City, or maybe it's No, no Tab City. Uh, again, kind of Smithson like collapse of drawing uh, and, and text, uh, whether it's to be looked at or to be read, um, but also the way that. Uh, uh, Prinsidi uh, talks about it. No Stop City proposed an extreme vision of industrial civilization as a producer of a decorative, repetitive, and horizontal system, and one thus devoid of cathedrals. Um, a system based on the re repetition of signs, at once diffuse and fluid, within which architecture and nature dissolved and disappeared in the amniotic space of metropolises. Um, so again, another moment you could say in the uh, text both the collapse of text and drawing, but, um, but also uh, the dissolution of architecture, and in particular as seen as the cathedral, in this har har horizontal, endless, repetitive uh, information city. Um, 1966 also, this is our building. Um, our school is also hitting its 50th anniversary. This is the Netsch campus, uh, designed and opened, opened uh, in 1965. Uh, the a and building, uh, which is our building. Uh, it's the first Netsch's field theory um, uh, buildings, which opened in 67. Uh, the first BR class graduated in 68. Uh, in a sense, uh, field theory, you could say, is the, really the rotation of two acetate sheets uh, on top of one another. Um, uh, so in a way, he's also a kind of paper architect, or uh, you know, Stan Allen before Stan Allen. Um, uh, it's actually a really, a super interesting building that no one really visits or talks about, um, especially when you think that it's really only a few years uh, after Sterling's Leicester Auditorium. Um, I think it's, it's a little surprising that it isn't uh, more well known. Um, moving down into the office below that involuted crystal, uh, I'm going to get lots of energy rays in there. Um, right, and half of that big canopy sort of a prototype for the Seattle Public Music uh, Library. Um, but also our friend Robert Smithson at the same time. Um, uh, so uh, Smithson's uh, mirrored crystal structure. Um, I guess I can say that at UIC we feel your pain at turning 50, since we will be following you shortly. Uh, so I should say, I guess, happy midlife crisis. Um, uh, now, at UIC, we're much more conventional in our, our uh, midlife crises. Uh, this is what we want in 1966, uh, the Avanti. I always wanted this car. Um, you guys here are much more sophisticated and sober in your midlife crises, which I admire. Uh, you just want to hold the ground. <laughs> um, modest and more realistic. Uh, of course, I know what really... Uh, that's the way the new building's going. Um, this is what I'm interviewing for, anyway. Um, <laughs> because I know what really lies beneath this hole in the ground, uh, also from 1966, uh, is the Batcave. 
Uh, this is really what you want, and I think I can offer this. Believe me, Scott and Liz are not going to give you a back cave. Um, just saying. Uh, also from 1966, though, is really the trilogy, uh, besides the Foucault, Words and Things, is obviously Architecture of the City, Perplexity and Contradiction, and, and launching what I would say, in some sense, is the contemporary age of paper, or the uh, regime of the architect critic, which I think is, uh, we are now at the, at the tail end of, which we will get to at the end, and what the implications of that are for uh, education we can talk about. I'll try to be on time, finish at 7.30. Um, so in a way, these books were already the 50 year anniversary, okay, not quite, 44 year anniversary, uh, of Port and Architecture, um, and, uh, you know, in a way that book, it always, I never really got the end of this book, I have to say. I was glad to hear Mark Lee recently, who said, he named the top five things that never helped in architecture, and number one was toward an architecture. Um, <laughs> there's also something about Lacan's vision diagram, and something about topology. There were five things that have never helped Mark as a practitioner. Um, so I was kind of glad that toward an architecture was one. Um, but in a way, like, architecture, revolution, revolution can be avoided a briar pipe. You know, I just I never kind of didn't register. Um, but I think uh, what I really want to talk about is the transparency, you could say, of form to meaning, or image to text, or object to thing, um, uh, or object or thing to word, in a way, in the image, uh, with the idea that this mass-produced object type that would, would allow industrial society to avoid social upheaval as a kind of problem solver. You know, the kind of self-evidence, the literal self-evidence, you could say, of the image of the pipe, subtitle, prior pipe after a huge claim about architecture, revolution, revolution can be avoided. This is it. Um, that's all you got for me? Um, but, you know, in a way, domino is the same uh, mechanism. Uh, a few years after Corb, of course, is uh, well maintained by the Greek. Uh, this is not a pipe. So, you know, in some way, I think that all of the neo-avant-garde, all of the architect critics, uh, in a way, are replaying that the Greek moved on Corbusier within the meaning of architecture. So, in other words, the separation of image and text, or the displacement, or the interference between uh, form and meaning. Um, and in a way, uh, the negative could also be stated positively, which is I a monument, on top of something that clearly is not a monument, but was not really, in fact, in a typical American um, loft building, you could say America's mass produced version of the Domino. Um, you know, with a huge sign on top of it. Uh, and then in a way, back to our friend Robert Smithson, uh, the scale of, of the letter uh, or word changes one's visual meaning of the word. Language thus becomes monumental because of the mutations of advertising. Uh, again, talking about the way in which uh, words or signs, in a sense, become uh, literal physical objects, or even, in my terms later on, a speech act, which you could say, I am a monument is, a sort of self-nomination that becomes a fact. So in thinking about toward an architecture and re-inhabiting it, or how one uh, would re-inhabit it 45 years after the fact, um, you know, it's, you could say, because 65 is also the 50 year anniversary of Corbusier's death. So I think it's not by coincidence that it is in 66 that you could say the architect critics rise from the ashes of the end of that project, and in a way, uh, the end of Corbusier. So one thinks about regulating lines and lessons of Rome, as, as which do not see engineers' aesthetic, that you know, in a way it maps that particular moment in uh, architecture. Um, you can say regulating lines, uh, courtesy of, of Haydick, engineers' aesthetic, courtesy of Severed Christ, lessons of Rome, courtesy of Rossi, and eyes which do not see, courtesy of Venturi. There's a kind of uh, dissection and uh, enhancement of one aspect of the text that then becomes a new project, a kind of fracturing of the Corbusian field into a series of, uh, say, um, more precise, specific repetitions. Um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, try to rationalize that field a bit, I guess, um, along uh, somewhat you know, contentious lines, but to think that there's a kind of axes of rationalism to empiricism, or let's say more like a top-down, a priori, uh, ideal logic versus a kind of bottom-up uh, factual uh, logic on the, on the one hand, on the vertical axis versus a kind of horizontal axis that you could say is the axes 
representation um, or formal expression from abstraction to convention. Um, in other words, you could say the articulable, uh, in Foucault's sense, running up and down, and the visible, you could say, running uh, left to right. Uh, within that field, I think that you know, one can start to think about the Rho-Hadic conjunction or mathematics or ideal mathematics uh, or for court regulating lines as that uh, intersection of rationalism and abstraction, uh, Ben and Price, or you could say cybernetics in place of mathematics uh, as that of abstraction empiricism type uh, as the intersection of rationalism and convention and the sign as the, uh, just the, the combination of convention and empiricism. So in a way, the, the chart, you could say, could be read different ways. It could be up-down connections, or they could be, in fact, across this way, um, you know, depending on the, the uh, tricky, let's say, affinities that one is looking for. Um, and it's sort of this sort of core 1966 or mid-60s post-core, uh, you could say, bifurcation of the field uh, that I want to sort of map out as a um, and this is my model. Uh, I don't do history, but I play one on TV. Uh, this is Jack Black from School of Rock, um, and this is how I think about history. Um, uh, although I'm going to prevent, present you with a school of paper, not a school of rock. Um, uh, so this is the beginning of that story. So you could say, and think back about the, the pipe, the kind of transparency of form to function or uh, uh, form to uh, meaning, or really I would say you could say form as much to ideology as it is form to function. Um, and in a way that the sense that that uh, self-evidence or transparency or seeming connection uh, becomes dis disarticulated, let's say, after the war. Um, and in a way, first of all, you could see it in Colin Rowe's terms, sorry, it's much more sharp on my screen, sorry about that, um, between uh, what Rowe calls physique flesh versus morale word, um, meaning that you know, the modern project for Rowe really was never coherent, it was uh, self-contradictory. Um, the words uh, themselves were self-contradictory, and in a sense, Rowe decides that uh, you go with the physique flesh or the form instead of the morale word or the ideology. Um, at exactly the same moment, or uh, more or less around that time, uh, Rainer Bannum also really diagnoses the same condition uh, in both New Brutalism and then later in uh, Theory Design in the First Machine Age. Um, with ism as a style, he says, versus ism as a slogan, or you could say the aesthetic, or uh, cubism is his example versus uh, 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 as an ethic uh, in the way futurism is. So the sort of two kinds of ism, ism as style, retroactive categorization of things that look the same, or ism as a projective act of uh, polemic that in fact has no particular coherent historically categorized look. And so you know, I think it's interesting that Rowan and Ben <coughs> identify the exact same phenomenon in terms of the form, uh, function, or really form ideology split, uh, but each chooses to go uh, a different way. Which is what gives us, you could say, that first four square that I suggested earlier. Uh, in other words, Rowe and Haydick uh, uh, and mathematics, and then Bannum and Price uh, as an example, uh, in cybernetics, and then Rossi and, and Venturi's background. Um, and I guess I, I put this up because I think that in a way it's the Rowe, Haydick, and Bannum Price partnerships are, in some way you couldn't imagine more paper architects than Haydick and Price, uh, but they don't quite um, inhabit the role uh, uh, fully and robustly, let's say, in the way that ultimately uh, Rossi and Venturi uh, will uh, in terms of the architect critic. In a way they still need a parallel partner. So it's really like the kind of implicit partnership of Roe Haydick and Ben and Price. In other words, you could say that form and ideology are still split in these two twin subjects uh, that haven't, that anticipate but haven't quite yet fused into a new role for the architect. Um, and so when critics then start to emerge later in relationship to architecture, uh, and one could put, let's say, Tafori with Rossi and 
Scully with the Venturis. Um, they have a very different relationship, you could say, than the way that Roe uh, does with Haydick or Bantam does with Price or others. Um, in a way, you could say that Tufori is the, you know, the deep frenemy, um, really abandons the role entirely of, um, uh, you know, ostensibly his model is against the operative critic, people like uh, Gideon's and Pevsner's, but, uh, and Zabrunozevi's, uh, but really you could say it's a disruptment with this new subject of the architect critic, really. In other words, realizing that the field has left him, uh, that there can't be a critical architecture, or he says, or a critical or a class uh, architecture, the only uh, class critique of architecture. So in a way, Tafori is the, um, fallout of the fact that these roles have been collapsed. Scully, on the other hand, maybe is just a sort of uh, cheerleader, um, not quite the collaborator in the way that you could imagine uh, Rowan Bannon. Um, you know, one who is happy maybe to identify the historian's revenge after the fact, uh, sort of saying, well, I did it you know, before, and now they're just continuing that. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, uh, after the fact role. Um, I, so in this story, the, the, the extension, you could say, um, of Roe, Haydick, and, and even Rossi is, is Eisenman. If, if, um, if Roe says that there's a split between the form and the morale, uh, and that one should go with the form, what Eisenman suggests that there's a split even within form. You could say that Eisenman gives us form versus form. Uh, at least that's the argument of post-functionalism. Um, and you could say, I would say, that, that the way in which that manifests itself of how you register and notate the argument of form, uh, classical, ideal, complete, versus fragmentary, and transformational, is through the mechanism of the index. In other words, in a certain way, architecture becomes a kind of writing in order for form and form uh, to be articulated and notated. In a certain way, it, uh, the, you could say the word Reemerges inside the work. The other side of the diagram has its kind of revenge in thinking about architecture as a kind of writing. Um, uh, on the other trajectory, you could say is uh, Kuhlhaas again, you know, maybe <coughs> two who inhabit the role of architect critic even more fully in some ways than Rossi and Venturi. Um, uh, although in Kuhlhaas's case, it's obviously split between could say program and program, or ideology and ideology. Uh, the issue is um, uh, that there is a, a kind of split within the, uh, the theory or the polemic, uh, and that really what we can do today is, is merely uh, why the expedient device of stacking is one way to impose one lifestyle, one ideology, uh, one program on top of another, um, that that becomes the uh, MO, and I would say that in a certain way, you could pick many terms, maybe for Kulhas, um scenario and script, although I reserve the word plot uh, in favor, in place of index to some degree, because in a way a plot, a little bit like Michael Fried's uh, argument about literalism, uh, you know, literal, is it a thing, like a joke, <coughs> a rock, uh, or is it a word? Plot has the same sort of connotation that's either a narrative uh, or a story, but it's also a site or a kind of uh, geological, um, ground down, and so in a certain way how different stories must be manifest and multiply the kinds of plots uh, or grounds on which those different stories uh, are superimposed on one another. Um, so in some way I would say that, uh, going back to our friend Smithson, that the index really is about the issue of objects to be read, in other words, uh, form against form that is meant to be read ultimately as an index. Uh, versus uh, the idea that words, in a sense, can be seen. So the interesting thing is that the way in which Kulas manifests the argument of program against program, or ideology against ideology, or lifestyle against li lifestyle, is actually through a collage of styles. Um, and so that becomes, in a way, that's the crossover. Style emerges uh, as the answer to the problem uh, of how you express that uh, collision in the same way that writing, in a certain way, uh, in the form of the index notation does so for Eisenman. Um, we're almost done with the school of paper. Um, in a way, uh, you could say, in Herzog Demeron, uh, it's no longer form versus form, uh, or program versus program, but really matter versus matter. Uh, and in a way that uh, they are also 
you could say, hybridizing the two genealogies. Let's say that the shorthand of Rossi and uh, Venturi Scott Brown uh, combination. Um, and I think it's interesting because they really are the tail end, you could say, almost um, deliberately <coughs> refusing the role of architect critic. Uh, this is Herzog. No, he's talking actually about Rossi's Architecture of the City, who was their great mentor. Um, no architect has ever written a text which has survived more than one generation. What survives, what influences architecture, what makes architecture architecture is the work. Uh, and in a way, you know, you could have, you know, Jacques interviews, you could say, and uh, does incredible exhibitions, but he's not really someone you think of as an architect critic, uh, as a pervasive occupation, or particularly a writer. Uh, and so, in a way, you can say that this is um, the revenge of this will kill that. Or let's say the, the revenge of the building back on the word or the book. I think that would be the obvious way that, that in some sense, uh, the mistaken way to read it. In other words, it's not really a return to the authenticity and reality of material. It's not kind of phenomenological, Ken Frampton, uh, wish fulfillment. Uh, it really is the fact that it's it's that the book itself, the word itself, in that in that context, uh, has been so pervaded by the possibilities of construction that it is now one uh, one thing. Uh, and so, in a way, for for Herzog, it's the internalization, you could say, uh, of the role of the architect. You could say Herzog is the exception that proves the rule uh, of this uh, condition. And you know, there's no one, you could say, no firm more uh, expert in the uh, job of uh, how this covers that. Or you could say, in rehearsing that issue of the information or the image uh, in the building. But the dematerialization of matter via matter. Um, uh, and so we drop again. We want to make building that can cause sensations, not represent this or that idea. Images we use are not narrative. They don't represent only this or, like, or that, like the narrative glass walls in the Gothic cathedral. The leaves in the Ricola factory, or the photographic facade, or the Elvis Vault Library, all these images are rather non-representational than representational. Um, and so, in a way, I think what, um, uh, let's say, the return to stone, but not, uh, but let's say, I think, stone that has been so uh, sublimated as language, as its opposite, uh, that the text is no longer necessary because actually the material is doing the work of the language. Uh, so the form uh, uh, is is the ultimate, you could say, uh, collapse again of, uh, of word and thing. This is Robert Smithson, not Ritzog. Literal usage becomes a incantory. It's not really a word. Uh, it's like an incantation where words do things. I mean, an incantation, you could say, is a speech act. Um, when all metaphors are suppressed. Here, language is built, not written. Um, I think that, the, that Smithson becomes a sort of um, uh, early theorist, you could say, of Herzog and Emma. Um, it's an on site with uh, elements. So you could say what replaces or what operates in the same way that the index operates to register the form versus form or the plot is what is the mechanism to overcome program versus program. Uh, it's actually the image, you could say, that is the one that serves uh, as a way for this um, intersection of matter and matter, of matter against matter. <coughs> you know, it's a it's a trajectory. I think that you know there are many successful proponents of Evans um, Redix, Sound and Vision um, is uh, made up of basically glass uh, television images from Dutch TV. Uh, our friend uh, Pier Paolo Tembrelli, Bauku in Milan, uh, um, House of Memory, which is just opening this week, I think, um, in Milan. Uh, uh, the, say, the image coming out, again, a little bit like Smithson out of the, the variation in the brick coloration. Um, I would also put in this legacy people like uh, Johnston Mark Lee and Kirsten Lukertz and um, David von Severin. Uh, I was thinking uh, if I wasn't so lazy on the plane, I would have put in Neil's 
High Line building with the graphics holding up the building. Um, but the way in which signs produce, or the image in a sense, produces a kind of materialization of um, uh, structure in that case. So uh, one of my favorite exchanges ever in uh, uh, this shows you're really a, like a music nerd. This would be like Big Jack Black of reading interviews. This is Alejandro Zayarpola um, talking to his mentor in Kulas. But do you not think that semantics also becomes increasingly less relevant in conditions of rapid change, growth, or information excess because meanings or signs tend to become obsolete very quickly? Do you not think that the real potential bigness in New York City is the replacement of semantics and signification as relevant techniques for the production of contemporary material culture? Uh, and so Alejandro thinks he's going to get the answer, of course, because he associates Rem's work with the end of the semantic nightmare. Uh, and the best response is, I think that you are incredibly <laughs> mad. <laughs> um, you know, which I, you know, I have to give uh, Alejandro great credit for keeping in the interview. Uh, I don't think I would have been that brave. Um, and then Rem goes on to say, semantics is a science that explores the afterlife of science. Singapore is an example of this. It has eradicated all authenticity to manipulate signs better. For instance, the death penalty, the interdiction of smoking, chewing gum. I believe these are fundamentally semantic techniques, an intelligent way of putting a country on the map. Um, and so, again, I think what Brem is really talking about, which you know, clearly I, uh, Alejandro coming of age, let's say, in, in the mid-90s at a point when, in fact, the quote-unquote semantic nightmare uh, you know, a postmodernism, of decon, uh, in favor of the new sorts of material logics that uh, the digital allowed, um, <coughs> let's say the performative, in Alejandro's and others' terms, uh, was finally the death knell to representation. And so, you know, death to Venturi and Jenks and everyone else. And I think he didn't expect really Kulhas to defend the sign. Um, but clearly it's also something that came back to haunt uh, Alejandro, as we'll see. Um, but I guess what I think is interesting about Brahm's argument is that it really is the idea of a speech act. In other words, it's the sign or the word that becomes another world. It's not an object that's going to be read. It's really the idea that you put out uh, a sign that becomes a material effect in the world. Um, and so I think that that's the, the naivete, as you could say, that he's uh, um, chastising Alejandro with. Um, I would say that, in, in a way, Rem's predecessor and alter ego in this, uh, not Rainer Bannon, but I put Rainer Bannon here as a, as a kind of model of history, let's say. Um, history is to the future as the observed results of an experiment under the plotted graph. The historian has the task of plotting a curve beyond the last certain point to see where it will lead. Um, sort of interesting provocation by Bannon, but one that was really taken up by his student, Charles Jenks, uh, so that more or less almost half of this diagram didn't happen yet, uh, but it's Jenks's history, 40 years of which is projected into the future. Uh, so he makes it in 1970, he predicts all of the movements that will happen, uh, given the sort of tendencies or lineages or genealogies that he sees uh, since 1920, uh, the possible inventions that will happen in the next 40 years, uh, and more or less sees these blobs get bigger and smaller depending on uh, the possibilities of new movements. In other words, he's also one who collapses, you could say, Bannum's distinction of the two isms. Isms as a category of work that looks alike, and ism as a kind of projective uh, polemic. And, and really, he becomes the great namer of movements before they happen. Uh, you know, I don't know, I would go uh, check on how many different forms of uh, radical this ism and something that ism occur in. Uh, Cheng's book, but it really is a kind of project of naming the thing and then assuming it will happen. It is a kind of history as a speech act. In other words, name it and it will come. But naming it in a way as a nominalist practice is tantamount uh, to having it happen. Uh, in that way, I think that although one doesn't really think of necessarily as he and Kulas uh, aligned, I think that really, and I can show uh, other diagrams that would, would sort of demonstrate the borrowing of this uh, 1970 graph uh, by OMA. Um, so, in these two models, the index, you could say that, you know, how you transform stuff of the world into legible signs, uh, 
uh, in today's language that would, might also emerge uh, in the language of emergence or self-organization, um, how things, material things, uh, are read as signs. Um, whereas you could say the Speech Act uh, is maybe the inverse of that, how you give a linguistic assertion the status of an alternative world. Uh, the Singapore rules, uh, the projective history, you could say, of Jenks. Um, and I think that ultimately there become two different kinds of politics associated with each of those gestures. In a way, the index ultimately, because it relies on, a, a, has a kind of reality principle about it in terms of a physical trace, a materially motivated sign, uh, that tends to suggest a naturalist politics. Uh, whereas the Speech Act really is not it's neither a kind of true or false condition relative to the natural world, it's simply an assertion uh, that becomes natural, you could say, or becomes uh, a new kind of world. And so again, I think, to go back to the Smiths and the idea that there are things to be read, that's what an index is, uh, whereas there's words to be looked at. Um, the last part of this, because I ran out of space, um, uh, is Alejandro's one-upmanship of Herzog Demeron's collapse of Rossi and Venturi, which is to say his own collapse of Eisenman and Kuhlhaas. Uh, associating Eisenman's work with control or being interested in the internal techniques of architecture as a product uh, versus power, uh, which is what he associates with Kuhlhaas, which is to say the external um, uh, uh, methods and techniques of acquiring projects. And in a way, you know, and I think this is Alejandro ultimately coming to terms with the you are very naive about science comment. Uh, in other words, he admits uh, that he started out as a kind of control freak, uh, but realized that somehow that wasn't enough, that he needed a rhetorical uh, sort of power to convince clients. And so in a way, he, he comes to the sign party belatedly and by necessity. Um, and in fact, he, he discriminates it by saying, well, there's material and technical organization as a architectural obligation, but there's also a kind of iconography. It's really looking for the collapse, you could say, of iconography and organization, uh, you know, again, uh, rehealing uh, or resuturing the, that opposition. Uh, but as much as being about Eisenman and, and uh, Kulas, uh, I would say once you start talking about those things, you're really talking about Frampton and Jenks. So really, I think the essay is, um, to overcome that 1980 postmodern moment of that debate between uh, Frampton's disavowal of uh, Portuguese's and Jenks's 1980 Venice Biennale. Um, and uh, maybe one also that understands the fellow traveler nature of Eisenman and Frampton or the altered ego status of Kulhas and Jenks. Um, but that, in a way, of course, Herzog and Demeron were already there. I mean, their office is born in 1980. Um, and Herzog and Demeron really provide, you could say, the minimalist, not in geometry or materials, but minimalist in a kind of discursive collapse, maybe literalist, uh, if one puts a positive sign on, on Michael Fried's term, uh, of collapsing what Frampton would denigrate as scenography versus tectonics. In a way, Herzog and Demeron answer uh, yes to both sides and more or less undo Frampton's opposition of either your authentic, tectonic material or your uh, ersatz iconography or scenography. Uh, and so really, in a way, the Herzog Demeron uh, project is a way to already, you could say, overcome the Frampton Jenks or organization iconography issue that Alejandro is um, in a way positing for his work. Um, okay. All right. Now we get even. Um, so, art and engineering. So, this is, I want to say, is one of the issues of the shift from paper age to the paperless age. Uh, and I think it's often a kind of commonplace, you know, you know students get it, well, I like art, I like engineering, well, you should be an architect. Um, you know, uh, that somehow those two things add up to architecture. And I think that we're in an age when these are two dominant poles uh, attracting different forms of architects. Um, uh, you could even say that there are two economics, two political economies, two markets that maybe underlie these alternatives within the field. Uh, on the one hand, becoming a kind of specialist consultant, uh, or on the other, 
the need to shift to a different sort of uh, economy or world in order to avoid that uh, metric world. Um, but I think also more often than not, we see them combined. Uh, in other words, um, I guess my claim would be that uh, if we're losing in, from the paper age the subject of the auteur, let's say, of the architect critic, uh, one of the figures that's replacing that figure is the artist engineer. Um, and I think we train a lot of them in schools. Um, I think there are a lot of them at the University of Michigan. Uh, some of them graduated from here. Um, uh, you know, that in a way that, that there's um, somehow the, the practicality and precision of certain technological answers that needs also to be offset with the random or the failed uh, or the incomplete. And that somehow the artist engineer will do this. And I guess to me, it will never add up to architecture, no matter how much you bang the two parts of art and engineering together, they won't get you architecture. Part of it is because I think that in a way, art and engineering both disenable a certain form of discourse uh, that is in, in a certain way critics, you know, necessary for uh, architecture to operate in. A certain way, you could say either they're resolving external forces and therefore there's a kind of answer to them, or there's a sort of takeover of an internal storytelling that really um, almost dies of its own uh, utterance. And so the idea of a kind of argumentative, discursive practice, which I think is what is at the core of architecture, uh, is not answered by art and engineering separately or in their new uh, hybrid form. Um, and, you know, I think you can, I guess there's another version, there, there are many versions of this. Um, uh, remind me to talk about the one that I saw recently at another school in the city, which I would call parametric postmodernism. Um, but that's the subject for later. Um, now, this is work that I admire a lot. Um, his old one, Alexhausen from Chile. Um, young Chilean architects, very successful, very talented. Um, and you know, part of it I, is because of the way in which it clearly is a, an attempt to recall a certain paper architectural project uh, of the 70s. And you may think its sources are, are clear in both of its uh, geometric and aesthetic forms of representation. Um, this is a diagram of Haydick. Uh, diamond House. I mean, the interesting thing about the Diamond House, um, I mean, uh, sort of quickly, that in, in a way that the Diamond House was, you could say, Haydick's way to suggest that, uh, to register that paper was always at the basis of construction. Uh, in other words, uh, if you start with a three dimensional cube, uh, you project it as a diamond. Uh, but if you want to generate a cube in a way, he says, you have to start with a diamond. In a way, the diamond is the projective basis for a cube. And so he starts as a kind of er cube, which is necessarily, in projective geometry, a diamond. But then when you project a plane that's a diamond, obviously, you project it in a way that is super flat um, as it's rotated. And so in a, in a way, the reappearance of the flatness in the object, or its paper quality, um, you could say it's almost self-evident uh, alternative to uh, three-dimensionality and realization, uh, returning it to a graphic. Again, this is uh, Pesa von Alexhausen's work. You know, they argue it as a kind of uh, super precise geometry that hits, you could say, the sloppiness of construction. Um, and I think so, in a way, to, th to think about the way in which this work, I would say, of the 70s makes its reappearance uh, in the now teens uh, of the new century. Um, in a way, the, 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 the first work, the Haydick work or others, was really, it was architecture to the degree that it resisted building. Now you could say that the argument is that it's only architecture to the degree that it gets built. Uh, and so I think that this is part of a kind of cultural realization and delivery uh, that has come to dominate even one might consider uh, more artistic practices, not just the more corporate BIM-oriented practice, but that somehow the apotheosis of delivery being the raison d'etre of architecture, um, which is, I think is an, you know, an interesting rehabilitation of those old diagrams um, um, uh, in a new climate. In other words, it's um, 
really the, the index of its construction against its geometric purity that becomes the architecture. And therefore, it's ne necessarily uh, construction as a part of its reason. In fact, that's its only uh, argument in a certain way. Um, uh, so with maybe five minutes left, um, since I was obligated to, this is UIC. This is Alvin Boyarski, who was a dean there in the late 60s and 70s, before he more famously went to the AA. Uh, in his time in Chicago, that's him in a, the recently opened Netch building at a student demonstration against Vietnam. Uh, and that is his Chicago a la carte, which became such an important text when he presented it as his uh, sort of interview lecture at the AA. And, and Kulhas was in the audience and was, uh, in a certain sense, um, persuaded forever uh, after seeing uh, Boyarski's story of the section of Chicago from the underground to the tops of the towers. Um, after Boyarsky, there was a little bit of a hiatus, but then we had USC's postmodern moment uh, with Tom Beebe and Stanley Tigerman as the directors uh, for about 13 years collectively. Uh, Stanley's famous Titanic or Crown Hall sinking into Lake Michigan. Uh, the juxtaposition, you could say, or the contrast with the school of really corporate Mesianism uh, to the South Side. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that in a way that to try to set the discursive context for UIC, which is that there's always a school about uh, maybe making isms uh, or movements um, and in rapid succession. Uh, Stanley obviously brought your own Greg Lynn, um, who did a stranded Sears Tower uh, when we were teaching together there. Uh, so as much as I guess I could say, I could make the argument for UCLA to UIC, which is the dominant one, but well, we could even go back earlier than that uh, to say that um, uh, that UIC also, in some sense, uh, came to UCLA. Um, uh, although Greg had his career at Columbia in between that uh, Chicago trip and Chicago brief appointment. Um, but you know what was really powerful about Greg's work uh, was that it was a, you know a project before it was a technology. I mean, you know, Greg, you know this uh, obviously directly. Um, it's really, you know, at UIC, let me tell you this about UIC, we didn't have a laser cutter or a 3D printer until I got there. Uh, 2007, like rubbing sticks together. Um, you know, so clearly in 1991, what Greg had was potatoes. Uh, he didn't have anything else because it was really a kind of geometric problem. It wasn't particularly a technologically driven problem. And so uh, when I present the school to potential students, and sometimes even my boss, uh, you know, I make this argument that when we were <coughs> under Stanley in the early 90s uh, at UIC, that in a way, of course, we know what the corporate practice was doing at the time, a kind of high-tech contextualism, you think of SOM, <coughs> Adrian Smith's project, whereas in, at UIC, with Greg's studio, this is obviously his hydrogen house, it's not a student project, but they looked exactly like that. They were carved up potatoes, it was a more resolved uh, material version, but at the same time, uh, in Greg's studio. So you could say, obviously, a disconnection between practice and academia. Um, and then you see Smith Gill today, or um, Adrian Smith today, 20 years later. And clearly, what it refers to as Greg's work, <laughs> not his own work. And, and I think that's the lesson of architecture schools. You're supposed to be out of step. You're supposed to be out of step with the practice. In fact, the practice wants you to be out of step with it. It needs you to be out of step with the practice. And so for anyone who says you should be doing what the offices are, they're crazy. Um, you know, and so I, you know, I think that it's um, you know, this idea that education, uh, like architecture, has to have an anticipatory aspect as opposed to a service one. I think it's also one that um, we've lost, and um, that's part of the Debbie Downer part. Um, uh, but we try to maintain it. Um, our local archive, you could say, goes from Goldberg Tigerman. Uh, and when we make our hires, we try to get people to do the same thing. Uh, so this is Sam Jacob and Paul Anderson, uh, two of our faculty, um, which is clearly, you know, maybe a kind of shout out to the history of the school. Uh, but of course, our own Andrew Zago was there too, and we can even make Andy take some decorative colors and patterns. Um, <laughs> against his better judgment. Um, um, so, you know, part of it is, you know, in terms of, of how you think of the school. I mean, I think of the school because I think of this field and the necessity of this field. And so you enter a condition like a football coach and you say, well, I've got some people already. 
Uh, I got Paul Price, and I got Penelope Dean, and I got Sarah Dunn, and you kind of map in there. Uh, you, know, you make a couple of big hires to start to uh, articulate the two twin lines, so Mr. Zago and Sam Jacob sort of seem to fit into that uh, genealogy to sort of to add some gravity there. Uh, and we have Alex Lerner and Paul Anderson, another graduate of yours, Alexander Eidenschmidt, Sean Lally, another graduate of yours, uh, Luis Ortega, Sean, you could say tying back even to Benham's uh, environmental project, um, uh, Luis out of Alejandro, um, much more into the kind of techno organizational problem, um, you know, Alex, uh, and then later, Billy Bear, another one of yours, uh, Thomas Kelly, uh, <coughs> Paolo Tamborelli, who we just hired as a Gruffalo Fellow, Stuart Hicks. Um, you know, this is, you know, not everybody, and it's, but it's really meant to say that. You know, for me, when I think about a school, I think it has to come out of certain combinations of the tradition and the argument and the discipline. And so, you know, it's very much the idea that we are, I would say, you know, if you, said, you look at this, you say, well, you're eclectic. Um, believe me, that's not what people think. <laughs> uh, I think we just do one thing. Um, but I think what it is is, you know, what we do is a discipline. And the discipline is about making arguments and recombining those possibilities um, and it's really interesting to see what the drifts are between uh, those figures. And so even when uh, we do certain work, like this is Alex's book on the Western Towns, which is clearly indebted to uh, a line from Aldo Rossi's Architecture of the City, I discovered the American city countryside to be decisive confirmation of this book. U.S. cities were laid out along grid lines, whether it established as main street villages, the image of which has become legendary in film westerns. In a way, I, I know Alex and the students take uh, the cinematic image, which is maybe even stronger for Rossi than the fact, uh, as a kind of false memory um, uh, as the basis for you know, the Western town. Uh, Penelope's work on the Super Day Corps, um, Sean's work on uh, kind of artificial environments. And I'm afraid these are really old projects because um, I didn't have time to download all the new projects, but look on Flickr if you want to see what's going on. But the, you know, I think that the, the point about the design of this really, and, and you know, we did steal a page from Alejandro. The first studio is really called uh, the, the two parts of the studio are called Control and Power, um, and it really is Paul Preisner and Thomas Kelly and Kelly Bear, and uh, I taught that one. Um, Penelope and Sarah Dunn and um, Stuart Hicks have taught the uh, now the, the power one. So there's a way in which we try to set up a kind of disciplinary debate immediately in the first studio around certain discursive oppositions. And really, the idea is that we try to stage ideological debate studio by studio. So I would say that's the way we try to overcome, or you know, uh, back to the example of Greg, how do, you, how do you achieve escape velocity from the present? It seems like that's the job of schools. And part of it is by looking backward. I mean, I think you can genealogically and have to look at foreclosed projects as a way to be untimely uh, and escape the metric order. And you also, the other strategy you could say is a logical one of uh, how to be counterintuitive. So I think between untimeliness uh, in terms of the use of history and kind of counterintuitive uh, form of logic, that those become the mechanisms to escape this, let's say, unfortunate desire that delivery and the project are the same thing. Um, even in projects that one admires, uh, uh, the Chileans, and in projects maybe that one has less tolerance for uh, other places. Um, so that's it. Thank you. President, um, <laughs> uh, thank you. That was uh, that was great. I, I mean, I think that the 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 presentation, even though you backed off saying that it was uh, you know, what you've been thinking about for a long time, to me it felt as though it was uh, something more than a summary, you know, of that. And um, if I think about the issue of language, uh, the, 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 the formal project of, from a from a conceptual uh, art practice at a time when 
if you think about five or six main books uh, in architecture, um, complexity and contradiction, um, the only one that I'm going to mention that doesn't have the word language in the title, John Summerson, 1966, classical architecture, Bruno Zevi, modern architecture, uh, Chris Alexander, pattern language, etc. So, um, do you think that um, somebody would say this is a, a return to language after all the anxiety about the post-language project, number one, and number two, going back to the the dissonance between delivery mechanisms and content, for which, let's say, the the bit between uh, Xyropolo and, and Rem, to a certain extent, and, it, and issues of media, meaning the building's going to kill everything again, because it had gotten killed, and none of these books were written that I'm referring to, even McLuhan, in a, in a way, they're not written today in a, in a media field for which uh, I would argue that uh, I would say this better participate with that, mm -hmm. rather than the building is again going to be in a position to to overcome language of another sort, of another medium, of another type, whether printed or digital. That it better participate with, yes. which is which is my personal argument for it's always a return to to language. But what's your? I mean, it might be an obvious question, but I guess I want to tease out a little bit more of that relative to uh, uh, kind of today's conversation. Um, I'm not sure that I can uh, answer it, but I think what, I mean, I guess the, at the base of this is really the idea, and I think you said at the end, that architecture is first and foremost a cultural project. And to be a cultural project means in a certain sense being obligated to discursive media in an array of forms, um, and not, uh, so I think there is a, I guess my fear is the closed self-fulfilling prophecy of the um, <clears throat> instantaneousness of uh, idea that becomes fact, or the, the necessity that somehow um, literal reality is now the argument. <laughs> and actually there's an interesting review by Dave Hickey about new phenomenon of pop today, which is that it's not like pop art, it's like just pop facts. <laughs> uh, you know, that the, the world has become uh, surveyable in such a way that any celebrity is now automatically a pop artist. Um, so, so I think the, the question of how in a, this set kind of setting, but also in office settings or cultural or institutions, you know, how do you maintain what I call that escape velocity? And so, in a way, you know, I don't have, I don't um, privilege the book or the word as the thing that does it, and that's why I think Herzog Gemmerlin to me are an interesting case about how, you know, um, I'll put your work in this category as well, that somehow the, the way in which the image operates also operates to provide an escape velocity from the current, which is simply a remapping of the current contingencies and facts, let's say. If I think about, uh the idea that school is supposed to be not, um, uh, you know, not run by market logics that will eventually sort of take care of itself on the one hand, and that post-2008, you might say that uh, the public is now Framtonian, looking for real stuff, no fucking around, uh, 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 exhausted with the icon even though at some level culture keeps asking for it in some way, whether openly like uh, with, with monumental projects or uh, in a more covert way, but still that's a problem. Uh, do you think that school is, is uh, more or less in one of those? I mean, I couldn't quite tell if it was just simply a collapse of all of that. And, and I, I, I want to argue that at some level, if you don't listen to, you know, we don't we don't listen to the, to the market uh, at one level. So what's the market of, of school at that level? Is it is it is it is it one that's really not acknowledging uh, the project of uh, the populist and staying within a let's say a, a, a mob 
our own local mob scene. I, that's the ambiguous thing, I think, of your proposal, but I want you to... Yeah, I mean, I think... I think to produce an audience in the world, you have to first uh, be part of one. And so, to me, the first step in schools is that the focus is clearly on organizing that audience uh, that seems to hold certain things in esteem that other people think it'd be crazy to hold in esteem. And then I think that ultimately, you know, it's the Steve Jobs model, that that fascination will out and the market will come to you. You don't model yourself after the market. You know, so I mean, it's not, it, you know, and the other thing is, you know, what size market is satisfying? And I think maybe today the idea is that only a mass market is going to be the one uh, that we can, you know, that there's only one market that exists. Whereas, you know, I'm still a believer in that there are niche markets and why I call us a boutique public school. Uh, we're never going to be big, and so we better celebrate the fact that we're small. Um, and, you know, I think that there is, you know, that and my interest is not how, how many, it's just how influential. And so, you know, influence and size are, you know, often inversely related. So. You know, I think you're, I mean, I think one wants to recombine, let's say, different aspects of culture to see what Frankenstein can come out of it, in a way. But I think, you know, it's, I think it always has to be tested against a confirmation of the world as we know it. So, yes, market, but I mean, like in the Greg example, it's going to be a, a market that's 10 or 20 years down the line, maybe, and that we can afford to test those markets that we don't know exist yet, because in fact, whatever we know, the market today certainly won't be around in 20 years. I mean, 2008 taught us that. <laughs> and so the issue of sort of modeling yourself after the 2015 market seems to be an evolutionary dead end. You know, maybe that's the, my admiration for Jenks. Um, I'm sure we've got a lot of questions, so any hands up? Questions? <coughs> And I, I mean, and that uh, that set of slides, which I did for my friend who's not even here, uh, you know, is what I give to students, like why you go to school and why you come to this school. And I think, you know, absolutely, uh, it's not like one size fits all. I mean, I think there are offices and schools that hang together, and there are different offices, different schools that hang together. So I don't think it's like school good, office bad. And, in any sense. And if you looked at 1992 at this school, you would say, yuck. <laughs> uh, so in fact, in a way, you know, I mean, in a weird way, UIC with no money, no technology was sort of early, even in some way, pre-Columbia. Uh, not pre-Columbia. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I mean, you know, and God knows there are 90% of terrible, terrible schools out there. 
right now. And you know, and, and probably as you're saying, actually capitulating to the market forces much more so than offices that are that in fact have much more nimble abilities to respond than school. I mean schools are incredibly slow moving animals and bureaucratic. And so part of it is to inject any form of change into them is much harder than opening your office or you know hiring a couple of people or you know hiring a couple of people. It just doesn't shift in the same speed. So yeah, I mean I, I don't have any particular faith in the university system or the academy per se. You know, in fact I think that you know I was describing one trickle up case, but clearly it works the other way around. You know I mean it, let's say research model. I have the idea, I mean, this is a, this is a personal metaphor as a card player. Uh, we, we play cards many times that this is more like, you know, Texas Hold'em rather than five card draw, which is you've got more cards and actually at the end of the diagram, nothing was, you didn't put any cards off the table. Actually, everything constantly kept being compressed and, and uh, contained. Nothing rejected and all uh, relational you know, sort of issue in a way. So I think that I agree with the idea, but I think so. The 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 explanation is maybe a little bit uh, off the the diagram, which sort of says as long as we can play uh, a power versus uh, control control project, which is you're saying it's a kind of classic dialectic in a way. They're both being they're both being used against themselves. And in, in fact, in the form against form and ideology against ideology, no cards being, you know, taken out of the deck in a way. And so at some level, maybe implicit is the idea that school isn't an isolated uh, project. Otherwise, you might be more interested in in eliminating all the things which could could antagonize that in a way. I, I mean, that, I'm I'm trying to kind of parse out between what you showed, what you said, and how you react. Uh, you know, react to it. Yeah, I mean, part of it is it's inclusive in terms of disciplinary issues, and maybe what you were saying at the beginning is it's exclusive in the terms of what I would consider to be external issues. So, in other words, we're not going to be like certain schools further up the coast and label yourself the social justice school or the sustainable school or even further down the other coast, the you know, parametric school. Or, you know, I mean, those, those to me are my distinction between themes and disciplines, and those are themes. And those are market niches and they're fine, and they have no half-life. So I think you have to keep the cards, those cards on the table, but you know, almost, but resist the kind of identification with a you know, bigger seeming problem. Uh, anybody else? I mean, I'm not sure that I totally agree with Alejandro's characterization of the two. I mean, I think it's convenient for Alejandro and important for him to set up that dichotomy. I mean, it's convincing, but not, you know, but it's not necessarily, you know, I think it's a fine structure, but it's not necessarily one that I um, you know, uh, feel like defending. So you're saying, uh, I mean, in a way, I think that the Smithson legacy is that one down the middle that ends with sort of memory. of words and things in some of those 60s practices that the articulable would become the visible and things or objects the visible would become articulable or readable. It was one of the ways in which the new professional 
subject of the artist critic or the architect critic realized itself as a, as a kind of mirror in, in work that tried to turn matter into signs or signs into matter. And yes, and then I did hedge the bet and sort of prefer a side. Um, <laughs> Signs becoming stuff as opposed to stuff that's being read. versus what he says are, are two different things. So I don't really, um, you know, let's say the conversation we had with, with Hitoshi in, in New York about schools, you know, Alejandro had no problem saying, well, Princeton, we do sustainability, we do this. I mean, it's sort of slave. I mean, a school like Princeton, you know, imagine. Uh, it's like Moise at Harbor. It's like the biggest fish in the pond who don't need to market and sell themselves short slavishly say whatever it is is going to get a market. It's sickening. And so, you know, there's no compunction, no sort of guilt, no compunction about it. Just like, well, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll say we do the green city and, you know, but we'll, we'll do something else with it, but it's fine. Now, I can't utter those words. It's impossible. So, you know, I don't understand why they need, need to. Right? I mean, because they're in these kind of markets that don't actually require them to sell out. Thank you. 
<laughs> Why isn't there more art at the end? Art fell out the end, and I guess the simple way to put it would be that you don't make predictions in the question. You can't play art to cluster. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in some sense, it is, uh, <clears throat> maybe this is the nostalgia part. It's actually, you know, an essay by Robin Evans who talks about you know, as much as he beats up on Eisenman in that generation, he nonetheless says that their writing operates in a certain way as a, as a theoretical model, and he differentiates it from a storytelling model of artists. Um, and so it, you know, I guess the, for me, the gravitational pull to the poles of art engineering uh, is you know, somewhere I don't want to go. Um, and I think that you know, the question is, you know, how, what, you know, I don't, uh, I, mean, I think that the, I mean, the practices that I would be interested in showing after the, I would say that they really fall out of Herzog like Demron and not so much Alejandro, so maybe that's back to Dana's question. So the, you know, in some ways, you know, Mark and Sharon and Balku and Kerstin and others, and Neutlings, you know, that that, in some sense, I find that persuasive work, but I don't feel like it needs to align itself to those who are not helpful to me to align with those stories, even if there are factual intersections that are easily documented. And you didn't ask me where OOO was. That's the way I... I'm an XXX guy. <laughs> Michael? Yes, my question is um, Moneyball. Um, maybe this is another way of rephrasing um, Sylvia's question, which is if you're putting the open A's together and um, you have like perhaps no money, and uh, does genealogy actually matter? Uh, or is it all statistics? In a way, my question is, Cut through this stuff oh, again. Oh, this is the archive question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm asking really, like, if, if you were to say how many, like, how many home runs yeah. versus how many RBIs versus your ERA or whatever yeah. of these guys, and you were just to, to run the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get I'm it. I'm asking, like, I'm not Billy B. I understand I'm not even Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's funny you bring it up because I brought it up a few years ago. Sylvia will, will report this at the conference of Rice. I said that I wanted to be the Billy B of architecture schools, and uh, in the discussion, Sylvia called me cynical. <laughs> um, uh, but after watching Hello Minister, if you ever watch the British show, uh, the civil servant says, "A cynic is what an idealist calls a realist," <laughs> uh, uh, which I didn't know at the time. Three years later. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to use it. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think that we have to operate, we, I mean, I, we do operate on the margins, you know? Unfortunately, when we buy low and sell high, we don't get the profit when we sell. Um, but I think, uh, you know, look, I mean, like I said, like in the, in the techno war, you know, Greg was doing potatoes when I was there, we just used a lot of foam. And I, I think that there's a kind of model of ingenuity and, you know, by sort of avoiding a high ticket item, there are ways to produce new kinds of work that wouldn't happen otherwise. And so in a way, you have to use your, you know, lack of resources as a, as a, as a constraint on the field that allows you to go somewhere where other hasn't been colonized yet. So I think it's a material thing as well as an intellectual project of how do I identify that terrain that hasn't yet been covered. And so 
why would you call yourself a boutique public school, or why would you, um, you know, decide that you're going to be a discipline school and not a theme school? And, you know, why do you choose players for different roles? Why aren't you just hiring everybody who does the same thing? You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it depends on yes, the kind of team you want to put together. I don't know that. I mean. I like the Billy Bean thing until it gets to the university level when <laughs> we are all being uh, metricized out of our existence. <laughs> so I think there is a, you know, um, I at, at the end I probably operate more intuitively than as the Billy Bean model vis-a-vis -vis personnel. Oh, you look so upset. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That was uh <coughs>